perfect motion to give a team consisting of a war historian and a moral philosopher. <laughs> Let's play ball. <laughs> ben and Lizzie clearly said that they wanted to minimize civilian casualties, that this was the overriding goal of their war. They said they would not bomb orphanages. Susan said they would. Jeremy, who's right and why? <laughs> Lizzie said, life is less important than the practice of religion. You're allowed to kill in war, so anything short of killing must be okay in war. This is crazy logic, right? Rape and torture may arguably often be less bad than death. Rape and torture are nonetheless prohibited and are not legitimate tools of warfare. The reason being because there is a distinction between attacking another person as an enemy combatant and attempting to destroy his very humanity and the constitutive attachments that give his life. Furthermore, we, put, we point out to you, Lizzie's point is factually false. For many people, the desecration of religious sites is worse than death. Many Jewish people would rather die than see the Temple Mount destroyed. We don't think that's an inherently rational or wrong valuation. Then what we were told, well, Susan said, collateral damage just happens. And if it happens, like, unintentionally more, then it must be okay to do it on purpose. Guys, <laughs> that sometimes, as a foreseeable but intensely regrettable consequence, people can't get to the hospital in war is not an excuse to bomb hospitals in war. <laughs> that sometimes the accidentally drop a bomb that happens to hit a religious site is different from intentionally going there and pissing in the font. Right? <laughs> These are really not equivalent actions. And even if you don't accept the moral distinction here, the doctrine of double effect, the practical effect of intending to do something very bad is that it happens more often than if you just did it by accident. <laughs> Clearly up, right? Then we will, we will, well, we did this once in the past. We did it at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and wasn't it a great idea? Now, I mean, possibly, possibly the most atrocious moment in the history of humankind, where the most number of human people have died in a fiery explosion, right? When historical evidence suggests Japan was losing and was going to surrender in a few months anyway, I don't know, guys. You can debate Johnny and the war history on this. I suspect that was an illegitimate act of war. The fact that America did it doesn't make it right. <laughs> <laughs> Three point extension. Why does respecting the rules constraining war matter? In short, war is awful, respecting rules sometimes makes it a little less terrible, and here are three reasons why. Firstly, because their policy undermines the respect for the humanity of enemy combatants and leads to mistreatment. Secondly, because their policy prolongs and exacerbates conflicts and heightens them. And thirdly, because it destroys the moral fabric of post-conflict societies. There's a moral distinction here. And the moral distinction is between attacking someone as an enemy combatant and attacking them as a human being. Between attacking them as someone bearing a gun against you, who needs to be stopped, but against whom you no longer act once the gun is down. That's why we don't harm prisoners of war. Between, and attacking someone because of him being a particular race, a particular religion, having a particular family, no, and targeting those acts. That's why it's legitimate to shoot a soldier in a foxhole who's shooting a machine gun at you, but not to take his mother out and torture his mother until he surrenders. Right? This is a basic moral distinction representing your respect for the fellow humanity of the other soldier. We put to you that when you order soldiers to desecrate religious sites, not only is this in itself an evil, it undermines the respect your soldiers have for the fellow humanity of the soldiers on the other side. They see them, no thank you, not as professionals who happen to be on the other side in a regretful activity that will hopefully soon stop, but as people for whom it is right to hate because of who they are. We put to you that the experience of American troops, no thank you, in Iraq shows that it's hard enough not to get people to be racist bigots when you don't do this. Can you imagine what would happen if we legitimated American troops going into mosques and pissing on the font, no thank you, and using dynamite to detonate the altars? We don't think we're going to see fewer Abu Ghraibs. We think as a basic fact about human psychology, this is going to make war worse. We think for that exact reason on Ben and Lizzie's own criteria, we shouldn't do it. Yes, Ben. Why is this different to bombing important sites to national identity, for instance? Why is it different to bomb religious no. sites? No, it's not different. If something is so deeply constitutive of someone's identity that they'd rather die than see the site destroyed, and you're attacking it for no other reason, no thank you, than to break their spirit as human beings, we think that's evil, we think that's wrong. Secondly, we think that their policy is going to prolong and exacerbate conflict because it turns conflict into a war not of people, not of armies, but a war of identity. 
bombing the mosque says, we're not attacking you as a Somalian, we're not attacking you as an Iraqi, we're attacking you as a Muslim person, and we will hunt you wherever you go. And that turns wars national, transnational, it widens the scope of war, and it lengthens the scope of war, because people may cease to have a particular government, cease to have a particular army, cease to pursue a particular policy, they are not for the foreseeable future going to cease become Muslims. The one very good instance of this, no thank you, is the Crusades. Because in the 12th century we thought it was an awfully good way to break the spirit of the Muslim people by pissing on their fonts. And arguably, we're still feeling the backlash. <laughs> Right? The third thing it's going to do is it's going to worsen bloodshed and relapses in post-conflict societies for the exact reason that in many cases, in the sort of fractured societies that we see after a war, the, sorts of the sources of traditional moral authority are often the church and the institution of the church. If, as Ben claims, this is going to weaken the hold of that institution, you're going to weaken the traditional sources of moral authority. This is important because the worst atrocities are never endorsed by a traditional moral code. The killing field, the Soviet acts of sending people to gulags, every dictatorship prior to embarking on crimes against humanity attempts to suppress and destroy religious in institutions because almost universally the traditional moral criteria say no. In a fragile post-conflict society, when you destroy the things that hold a fragile moral environment together, that sustain your traditional identities, you're going to remove those kinds of moral restrictions on human behavior. And we've seen this happen, as when Soviet troops going into Eastern Europe deliberately destroyed religious sites so that they could, so that they could consolidate their ideological control. We saw this with the Khmer Rouge and the killing fields. More importantly, we see this in Africa, where the destruction of churches and traditional institutional centers of authority lead to relapses into tribalism, <coughs> legitimate acts of war against fellow tribes, such as eating their hearts in Liberia and Rwanda, as Fred would know. So what do we tell you today? Firstly, right, their policy makes conflicts worse because it makes soldiers brutal and vicious to each other. Their policy makes the conflicts longer, and their policy makes relapses more likely to happen. For all those reasons, and on their criteria, the motion falls. <laughs>